Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and thanks uh, Dylan for the invitation to this interesting uh, talks uh, series. Uh, our presentation aims to introduce you uh, to our work and research in material for design. Uh, I will explain uh, some theoretical concepts very quickly. Uh, and uh, some case to studies uh, picked uh, from our investigation at Polymy. After that, Barbara will present uh, the framework of her uh, PhD thesis. Audio. Okay, sorry, <laughs> it was not. Um, I don't want to lose time to introduce myself, Dylan did uh, in a very proper way, um, but uh, the only thing that I want to highlight that uh, I have been dealing with material uh, since the, over the last 20 years. Here you can see my um, research group, mostly composed by PhD candidates. Uh, which uh, together with also some colleagues from Italy and from other foreign countries contributes to a rich knowledge regarding material for design. Uh, but what is better is to focus on the research topics uh, developing today, uh, ranging from uh, augmented materials to DIY materials, considering materials from waste, addictive technologies, and uh, material education up to biofabricated materials. I want to add here uh, that we have partners in many departments uh, and different institutions around the world. Uh, in fact, we believe that uh, collaboration in research is fundamental and uh, we strongly believe that uh, the climate of sharing purpose and result is very important for this kind of uh, research. Uh, I only make a mistake. In this slide, I thought to be a good idea uh, to show this uh, rudimentary scheme where I tried uh, where I tried <laughs> to illustrate my personal uh, research path. Uh, I drafted I drafted it uh, when I was looking for a sense uh, to put in order the train of uh, thoughts of all my investigations on material for design in the last 20 years. Uh, putting everything we have done, what we are doing or try to bring out, and uh, uh, what we will do in the future. We'll not be able to talk about everything today, of course, but I'm going to explain a couple of concepts uh, and approaches. And uh, you have to, and here you have the uh, general overview, a kind of map. Uh, to understand the global sense and maybe don't get uh, lost on it. <laughs> um, right, thanks to my colleague Elvin Carana and with, other co with the collaboration with the other uh, great collaborator of us, that is Owen Pedley, we got the definition of uh, material experience. And we define as the experience that people have with and through the materials uh, embedded in an artifact. The material experience uh, framework is composed by four uh, interrelated levels. Uh, the sensorial one, emotional, expressive or relating to meaning and uh, performative. We edited the two book, collecting contribution from investigators uh, around the world. In this uh, last book just published, uh, the yellow one, we got uh, the evidence uh, that we succeed in expanding territories of material experience concept because between all the contributors, um, we collected also around 20 cases telling about existing investigation of young material researchers, and Dylan was between them, uh, around the world. And we dedicated them a specific uh, section title around the corner. And I think is a valuable uh, results, a valuable original contribution of this new book. Uh, with Elvin Carana, we also developed um, a method called uh, Material Driven Design Method uh, to facilitate the design for material experiences. 
I will, uh, it will take too long uh, to explain you now uh, all the steps, but I want uh, you to understand about this helpful uh, tool that was dedicated to design students and professional is that the design process can concern the material and its qualities. The design process, in fact, can start by exploring the material potential and even before the study of the form of the artifacts. And this is a, an important thing uh, to, to, to understand. In, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, it is evident how designers' attention turned, uh, has turned toward materials. All the design blogs, social media, and so on are full of experimentation with materials starting from unconventional sources. And we define this phenomenon as, uh, and we call it uh, DIY materials, do-it-yourself materials, that are materials created uh, through individual and uh, or collective self-production experiences often by techniques and processes of the designer's own invention as a result of a process of tinkering with materials. Um, after a lot of investigation on these topics, we can say that the DIY approach to material put the designer in the situation to create samples of material proposals, material draft, and material demonstrator that could be for, further investigated uh, when they demonstrate the potentiality to become circular and more sustainable material solution as uh, alternative to traditional one. Uh, okay. The designer uh, starts the material experimentation using unconventional sources as raw material that could be waste, uh, scraps, organic substances. Uh, the materials come to existence after a series uh, of iteration uh, in a trial and error process. We call this process uh, tinkering with material to highlight the experimental character of this procedure and uh, the fact that usually there is uh, um, he, uh, there is also the involvement of uh, low-tech uh, processes and uh, instruments and tools. Last but not least, it is important to consider the direct and sensorial involvement with uh, the samples of the material in the making process that can directly inspire the designer and can also indicate suddenly which path is more promising uh, or not. So this in, uh, direct uh, inter interaction of the, of the sample is uh, important, very important things. With the materials developed thanks to the to tinkering and DIY approach, uh, it is possible to have almost an intimate relationship, as shown by Sofia. Sofia is here, I think, <laughs> as shown by Sofia's research work. In fact, she began um, her research journey uh, by experimenting with the pectin based biopolymers. And shortly, shortly after that, uh, the first lockdown arrived. It was around March 2020. I think you remember it. Uh, so isolation, social distancing, inability to move came. In this strange, in this, uh, strange situation, uh, the samples of material that Sofia managed to produce became her flatmate and best friends uh, of that time, I think. And uh, Tinkery, it was the perfect activity for created locked down material using home sources, uh, substances as ingredient uh, and for the, this devel developing material. Uh, in particular, we also have be grateful to Amazon as well to send us some <laughs> ingredients in that moment. Uh, the power of inspiration linked to the tinkering processes, already well, well known in the HCI community, 
is also applicable to biofabricated materials. Indeed, tinkering with biology leads to into intuition and intuition leads to into innovation as it was stated in the DIY uh, bio manifesto. To demonstrate how true this statement is in our little experience, uh, I will now tell you some case studies uh, came from uh, master uh, project of uh, developed by master students who have used uh, tinkering with biofabricated materials. Uh, method of time uh, was the first uh, research using living materials that uh, date back to 2015 when Stefano ordered the Ecovative Grown It Yourself kit and uh, he started bio tinkering with mycelium. It was an investigation of the relationship between uh, time and materials for design. Through the material-driven design method, a composite material based on mycelium has been developed, uh, defining a unique and significant material experience uh, linked to the passage of time, underlining the materials, genuine, spontaneous, and dynamic characteristics. Uh, an original results uh, concerned the inclusion of uh, different seeds, uh, such uh, chia, flax, and the physilium, uh, which led to new expressive technical and manufacturing characteristics linked to the craftsmanship tradition, assimilating the process to clay modeling. In fact, the, these uh, seeds included in the mycelium have allowed the material to be moldable uh, directly by hands. More recently, uh, Michela's research has focused on the acceptability of uh, these novel biofabricated materials to favor the more rapid and widespread diffusion in uh, society. This obviously is uh, aimed to increase the ecological uh, transitions efficiency by using more sustainable materials in the substitution of the more uh, impactful uh, ones. Uh, given that, as Bruno Munari, that was an Italian designer, said that today's children uh, will be the tomorrow uh, adults, the idea was to introduce these biofabricated materials for the creation of a toy, including a technological devices uh, and a series of material components based on, uh, fun on mycelium and fungal uh, chitin. The idea uh, was to work with the children to develop their sensitivity and appreci appreciation for this novel biofabricated material, exploiting uh, one of their favorite activity that uh, is uh, to play. Thanks to the collaboration with Mogu, uh, that is an Italian company pioneer in producing uh, interior design product based on uh, fungi uh, bioproduction. Uh, Michela had the, the opportunity to experiment and bio tinkering with mycelium. Uh, and uh, one, uh, another interesting thing is, this, uh, is the fact that this project includes uh, a kit for growing uh, mycelium, mycelium dedicated to kids. Uh, another research developed thanks to an internship at Mogul as well is CARIE. Uh, CARIE is an experimental study applied to bio-based fungal materials uh, and focuses on their relationship with the timber woods. To bio the the biotinkering activity in this case was concentrated on finding the right combination between the right wood and mycelium. So to find the perfect match between these two elements. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, Carlotta uh, tested uh, uh, the level of compatibility, compatibility and the structural resistance of each different wood essence uh, through prototypes. Later, Carlotta, uh, also thanks to these prototypes, uh, developed a series of uh, product concepts, uh, try to imagine uh, the potential of this, uh, this material also in the, in the application. In uh, these other recent uh, case studies, Elena uh, perform a detailed biotinkering with living mycelium to test their responsive properties to different stimuli and evaluated its use as a biosensor in the field of uh, interaction design. Um, uh, subsequently, she based her further um, design research on the best stimulation of mycelium based on its best reaction and uh, the stimuli were white touch and air as uh, she found out. Also, uh, in this case, the research was possible thank the collaboration with the Mogu, uh, and it show how collaboration with companies or even startups is fundamental uh, sometimes in this, uh, in this field. Uh, another project is uh, the Organs Project, uh, focused on uh, introducing uh, zero-impact bio-based material alternatives uh, to the existing material application, and here we are in the footwear industry. The theme of the thesis of this research uh, revolves around the notion of back to nature. Uh, by exploring and detecting natural material possibilities and reintroduce plant-based material in, uh, in industry. The Oshri, in partnership with, with Flocus, so another company, uh, Flocus is an Italian uh, textile company specializing in Capoc, uh, and uh, um, AECBC um, company that is focused on sustainable shoes. Uh, she has explored the use of plant-based material together with mycelium for eco-responsible shoes. With this project, Flocus Capoc combined with mycelium uh, is the protagonist for a zero impact bio-based material for the footwear industry, providing sustainable solution with a comfortable fit. On the other end, these case studies, we are a bit far from fungi, but uh, we decided to include also algae. Uh, in these case studies concern the, develop, the development of uh, hybridized ceramic with algae from the same river um, that provides the clay. Uh, in this case, uh, biofabricated materials are responsible for a positive uh, effect regarding also a social innovation process since part uh, of the project was focused on the, on, the on the community of Nove, that is a small village in the north of Italy, where once upon a time there was a strong tradition of working with ceramics, a tradition that now is uh, a 90% uh, lost. So thanks to biotinkering and this uh, DIY approach, Elena's uh, intention right from the start uh, was to revive the traditional uh, ceramic manufacturing, demonstrated that innovation is also possible thanks to working directly on the recipe uh, of the material. She, so the, the project focused on the hybridation of uh, the ceramic material with the natural element of the territory. Algae have been identified as uh, um, valuable hybridation elements, thanks to uh, the fact that uh, they, they are very present in the, in the river banks and uh, given also the reproduction speed. Uh, they have been demonstrated to be an excellent element uh, for hybridation. The use of algae to place both on the hybridation of the material on pasta 
uh, and uh, also as a glazing, opening new visions and the expressiveness of the traditional identity characterizing uh, ceramic material. The algae added to the ceramic uh, pasta mixture led to changes in the material properties, which are also reflected in the aesthetics one, uh, and the improvement uh, regarded uh, thickness and white. Uh, the algae added to the glaze uh, surprised uh, with uh, a lot of different color affected by the various uh, health condition uh, of the river. So the color changed uh, if the river was more or less polluted, for example. And now I can leave the stage to Barbara and I to finish the presentation. Thank you. Uh, just one moment. Okay, so you can see my full screen, right? Okay, so uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, it's all fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you, Valentina, for sharing uh, the stage with me today, and thank you for to the organizer to be part of this panel. I'm really pleased uh, to be able to share part of my PhD research. And I will start uh, by describing, uh, uh, let's say the last case studies we brought today about biotinkering. Uh, again, it's not mycelium, this time is bacterial cellulose from kombucha, which is uh, an in uh, material we are researching inside uh, the FORMA project, uh, which is a funded project by Politecnico di Milano for the basic research. And uh, basically is a design exploration on biofabricated material where we are, uh, as I said, focusing on bacterial cellulose. We are a multidisciplinary team adopting an exploratory research and we are dealing with bacterial cellulose on different, uh, from different perspectives. So for example, we are uh, wondering which uh, type of design processes can be, um, uh, can be experimented on a culture liquid level or uh, while hybridizing the bacterial cellulose with other material, for example, technical components. And we are wondering which uh, future field of application this uh, uh, biotinkering experiment and into wearable fashion, fashion tech and even healthcare. Um, I'm part of this project because uh, my PhD research is uh, uh, about biofabrication. Actually, I'm trying to frame biofabricated material for sustainable design. As was mentioned before, sustainable design is what defined better my background from the last 10 years, let's say. So uh, it's true that uh, designers aim for sustainable solution is a common trigger in biodesign practice. In fact, uh, uh, biofabricated material have many sustainable positive features that can be quoted. Uh, just to be quite fast in this presentation, I want to highlight that maybe in this historical period, one of the main properties or features that uh, biofabrication can boost is uh, bioeconomy and circular economy. Just to quote uh, very quickly two case studies, on, on the left we have Blast Studio there is, uh, uh, that is uh, suggesting mycelium as a urban stomach uh, by uh, using uh, the discarded cellulose from the city waste to be used as a substrate. While on the right, we have one of the many examples in which uh, mushroom cultivation starting from uh, coffee waste can um, feed local and symbiotic relationship among different companies and developing uh, systemic design approaches. So uh, within my PhD research, I started to collect case studies as, a, as usual uh, uh, research path. Um, but uh, since the beginning, I was um, a bit um, in doubt because uh, the, the nature of the project I was collecting 
was very wide, uh, passing from being uh, super speculative to being quite feasible. And uh, it's, it's not uh, uncommon that uh, some uh, very speculative project that, that start uh, as a critical uh, uh, stimulation um, in a may, maybe even too much artistic way became later startups and suddenly companies. So what I, I, I build up this taxonomical scale in order to make some order uh, and giving some meaning to the case studies I was collecting. And uh, from the early finding, I can say that uh, when there is uh, uh, more feasibility of the project, we are usually talking about uh, uh, an organism that is already dead, meaning that it has been killed somehow to make the material inert uh, during the, the use phase. Um, in, in this uh, type of, of project, uh, there is a higher level of engineering and programmability which leads to the major feasibility uh, that brought also more easily this project on the market. But there is another very important part uh, of these case studies, which are more related to speculation. In this case, uh, most of the time, the organism is kept alive and is taking part to a process of co-design fostering uh, uh, somehow uh, um, a feeling of collaboration and affection uh, through relationship uh, that the organism developed or with the designer or with the final user. This freedom that uh, has uh, the living organism inside the project, uh, of course, lead to a certain amount of uncertainty um, concerning the outcomes of, of the project. Actually, livingness is becoming a very important quality in, uh, in biofabricated uh, materials and also in biodesign projects. Some scholars like Elvin Carana are wondering if livingness will become a, a typical quality of everyday artifact. When the organism is kept alive inside the project, what happens is that the design outcome can be named as a living artifact and all the abilities of the organism are brought into the artifact. So the artifact is enabled by new characteristics, new features, new abilities. But uh, all these uh, um, excitement for livingness uh, opened for me a second research line within, within my research part, which was uh, related to those features of inert materials that can allow instead uh, livingness. In fact, uh, uh, on our planet, uh, there is no it boundaries among inert and alive materialities. And on those relationships, I'm trying to investigate better. I started from the concept of bioreceptivity, named as the aptitude of a material to be colonized by one or several groups of living organisms. And even though the concept of bioreceptive design is already uh, known in the architecture field, I somehow pointed out how some case studies standed out uh, also in the design field for the possibility of being associated with bioreceptivity. Therefore, in a recent study, we, um, we defined bioreceptive design in a more extended way, stating that every material or artifact that are intentionally designed to be colonized by life form can go under the umbrella of bioreceptive design. In, in this uh, particular uh, design field, uh, the designers can act on three different levels. It can act uh, on the material composition, as in the case of Ecovirus by Martina Taranto. Here, a special mix of material are um, uh, cap capturing water through capillarity in order to foster the vegetal growth also in very arid uh, environments. Or another aspect, very important for bioreceptivity is the level of surface design. 
Here I'm quoting the work of Biota Lab, uh, also headed by Marcus Krutz, and it's possible to see also how computational design and additive manufacturing play a very key role for what is surface design. Actually, it's very important for bioreceptivity because the biocolonization is mostly happening on the surface. But the designer can also work on the whole system of the artifact, like in the case of Ortus, where Ecologic Studio have designed the general shape of this biosculpture, but also the texture welcoming a special material composed by uh, the gel and the cyanobacteria in order to uh, create oxygen by photosynthesis. Um, we, we were able to outline a procedural thinking for bioreceptive design, and I think uh, some of the aspects of this um, methodology can be useful also for uh, all the designers that somehow are dealing with the living, because we suggest uh, that, uh, um, first of all, the designers need to understand the organism requirement to stay alive and match this with the environmental parameters that he has or he or she has. And we named as correspondences of bioreceptivity this dynamic approach that is relating the material intrinsic properties, uh, fostering through them uh, the organism requirement despite the environmental parameters that we may have. Um, Bioreceptive design, as well as many case studies inside biofabrication and biodesign in general, are about relationship. And stealing the words that the Studio Sidiana use, used to describe their own work, which has been included in the bioreceptive design observation that we have done, materials and forms can act as physical grammar of relationship among different species. And this led me to, to the conclusion because in trying to frame biofabrication and biodesign for sustainability, I came out with the conceptual framework on, of healing materialities stating that uh, sustainability uh, acts on two different levels within biodesign. On one level, we have uh, a more conceptual level of sustainability in which these case studies are pushing awareness, affection and care, encouraging radical behavior changes. And on the other side, we have a more practical, practical level of sustainability where um, alternative materials are provided and uh, uh, we have uh, efficient uh, solution like clean processes or circular models. And both these two opposite uh, end of my taxonomical scales, uh, scale are actually fostering one to each other in a continuous loop of information. As I said, uh, some speculative project uh, are then suddenly uh, seen after some here as a real company. So it's, it's, um, it's correct to say that there is a loop between these two op op opposite uh, nature of the project. Um, so uh, the concept, uh, the, the conceptual framework of healing materialities uh, is what I use to include my study, which is both on living materials and on life enabling materials, for example, the bioreceptive one. And I'm trying to use this framework to define the boundaries of these newly designed materialities, where the final goal is to support life. Um, I'm, I'm finished with this slide, but if you like to follow uh, this research part, you can have a look on the website healingmaterialities.design where I'm sharing part of this, uh, of this research.